This is Kane Fitzwater, and you're watching my channel. I apologize for the late video. Um, I had tried to record this video a couple of days ago, and it just wasn't right. Um, I was rambling on, um, the lighting was way too dark, and it just didn't come out right, so I decided to scrap it and do it outside. So this is what my backyard looks like. Uh, we're on the patio. Um, it's a beautiful fall weather here in November and I hope you don't mind the wind and the rustle of the wheat, uh, leaves and all the beautiful sounds of fall in the suburbs. But today, we're going to talk about character arcs and why we're going to use this as part of our pantser method. For those who are used to having an outline before they jump into the actual writing process, um, you may have a hard time figuring out where you should be going with this story as you're building scene by scene. And I get that, I understand um, where you're coming from. There's only so much um, doing action and reaction and pitting intention and raising the stakes could only do for the story. You kind of had to have a roadmap, so to speak, to know uh, when to layer on the tension and where things should start taking a turn. Um, the reason why I advocate using a character arc instead of a plot arc for your roadmap is because we're following the characters as we are writing in this pantser method. We really don't know the overarching plot arc as we are discovering our story. And uh, we are journeying through the story with our characters. The characters are our vehicle for our inner reader. So this will help you figure out where to take the story to the next level beyond just tension and raising the stakes and action and reaction. Um, some of you may be asking why I'm not doing this in the very get-go and um, just lay it out there and then do the other videos. Um, this is all about transparency. Um, when I was writing um, as I go, um, I didn't really need this type of roadmap until just past the middle part of the story. Um, I needed a little bit of a guideline of when should I start planning for the ending. Um, as you are writing, you will have expectations about where things should go and eventually you're going to have to think about your ending and how that's all going to um, conclude all the loose ends that you are creating in your story. And the character arc is going to help with that. So. If you are still in the very beginnings of the story and things are going pretty well for you as you are writing, please do continue to write. Continue to do your action and reactions um, and the tension and the race and the stakes. Um, if you are still in the beginning of your story, you're still learning more about your character and the role they're living in and the current situation that they're trying to break out of. So I'm going to talk about the plot arc just very quickly, uh, what that is. Um, all stories uh, come into a circle. So let's pretend this is a circle. Um, it's not a perfect circle, but it will do. Um, 
as I was saying, all stories come to a circle. You have a beginning. We'll put this as zero right here. And it will come to an end. And with sequels um, and other books in the series, they will continue on growing and changing, transforming the world, until finally their story comes to an end. If you have watched my old video, How I Do Story Structure, I tend to think in terms of circles or a clock because um, it just makes things easier in a visual representation. For instance, you could divide the circle into different parts to help um, keep you in track in where you should be changing or coloring or coloring your world and um, the events that occur. So if you are familiar with a three-act structure, you will recognize this is the first act, this is all the second act, which is the entire middle part of the story. Then you have the third act. Uh, in story theory, uh, the second act equals the same length um, to the first and third act combined, um, and they make up the whole of the story. And most stories that follow the typical plot formula um, go into the second act and the third act um, in proper clockwork. Um, they go into the second act um, into a quarter of the story, so we'll call this the 25 mark. And they go into the third act three-fourths of the way of the story. Of course, we're talking about the length of the entire minutes or pages of the story that's given to the reader or the audience. And of course, we have our midpoint, which is, of course, our 50% uh, mark. It's halfway. So we'll just dot it down here. So, in the plot arc, we have a familiar territory um, before we go into the unknown, which is why we have this on the bottom here in the circle. And as they go through this unknown territory, they attain something that changes everything and they're able to bring it to the familiar realm and bring about change because they themselves have changed. This is the type of formula that's very popular in um, Greek and Roman stories um, that Joseph Campbell had um, studied. Um, this is the type of formula that most Western audiences um, typically like um, it's very familiar to them. Um, their grandparents and their grandparents before them tend to like this type of structure. Um, there are different type of plot structures um, like this. There's like the five act where you break into what would what would one call the second act, breaking into the unknown territory just a little earlier. And the events that play out in obtaining the thing that they want is played out a little bit more. It's not just a dash here. It's not a pinpoint. Um, it's a whole entire act. And they break into the familiar territory again, um, having changed for the events that occurred in the previous acts. That's the five extra.
structure, then you have the zigzag structure, which breaks the circle into further points. Um, dr the dramatica structure put in um, minor points on the circle. Um, for instance, you have the inciting incident, which we put it as II. They also have what they call pinch points, which will be here and here, along with the midpoint, which we put down as M. So we'll say pinch point 2, pinch point 1. Pinch point 1 and pinch point 2 is where the exterior forces or the antagonistic forces showcase their strength and do something to the hero that um, cause them to change their plans or alter what they have been doing prior to uh, the situation. And of course in the dramatic structure, they break the third act up into fourths where they create, where this is the resolution after this three-part movement of the three, the third act. That's the dramatica structure. Welcome to the outside, where everyone wants to have their say, including airplanes. So, the dramatic structure will go ahead and break up the third act into parts. You have a bit of a three movement part before you get into this resolution. We'll call this R. Uh, we'll call this A, B, and C. So, that comes from our current movie industry, the whole Dramatica structure, um, Saving the Cat, all of them kind of break up the circle and give it different flavors. Um, when we are writing through the Panzer method, we are not going to see this until we go into editing. As we are discovering the story, we're not going to recognize more or less the inciting incident. We're going to recognize how the character feels from the events that is similar to the inciting incident. They're going to bumble around and wander around until they get their act together, so to speak. And we're going to feel the depths of their sorrow when they go through the darkest hour part of the story. Uh, we're not going to see these events um, except through the character's eyes. So, let's talk about the character arc and uh, what that entails. The character arc and the plot arc kind of run in a parallel. Uh, one event could not occur without the other. The exterior forces or the antagonistic forces that occur in the character's world cannot be resolved until the character is able to take care of the inner conflicts that are bothering them. Um, as they go through their internal, foreign, unusual territory within themselves and come out as a different person, they won't be able to resolve what's going on in the world around them. And that requires change. That requires the character to let go of their old habits and become a new person. Now, this is not a new uh, idea. Others, um, like Michael Hughes, um, had said that um, they have to um, leave their previous identity, their whole life narrative behind, and become the true essence of themselves. 
Um, others had said that they are living in a world of lies and they have to progress towards the truth. Or another thing that you may have heard of is that they have a want, like, oh, I want to be a superstar, I want to be famous, but what they really need is a deeper need that is going to be more satisfying to them, which is probably the love and adoration of their friends. Having friends in their lives that's going to be supporting them as they go through this journey. True friends. All of those resemble a positive character arc. Um, that type of mentality is not going to help, or at least it's going to alter when it comes to a flat or a negative character arc. When you are dealing with a fallen hero like Anakin, he is um, going to begin with the truth, um, obtaining what is false and become that false identity. Um, he leaves behind something to become something else. And with flat characters, they have, um, they don't really transform, but they transform the world. And I've discovered that they are able to transform the world because an old philosophy or an old viewpoint had died and they obtained a new viewpoint, a new philosophy that was able to help continue their progression in helping make the world the way they want it to be. So what we're talking about in character arcs in general for all type of characters, whether it's positive, flat, or negative, they're leaving behind the old to become new. They're leaving behind old habits that no longer serve them, old narratives that uh, really do not fit their current state, and um, old viewpoints or old philosophies that's just not going to cut it anymore. So how does this change from old to new very slowly throughout the whole story and as this transformation occurs from going from the old and becoming reborn um, they're going to act in certain ways that um, you will feel or at least you will identify as you are writing So, let's begin at zero, the very beginning of the story, where they are living in their old world. This is mirrored in their whole world around them, their family, their school, their house, their clothes, everything. Um, how they present themselves, how they see themselves, how they treat others around them, whether it is healthy or unhealthy, um, that is their old way of life. That is their um, set routine, set habits that they are used to and they're familiar with. Um, it is something they're comfortable, they don't want to change and leave. Um, they're pretty much content in their own way. Until something breaks that. Something occurs that forces them to go out of their normal set ways and forces them to do something that um, they never had done before. That will be the inciting incident. Something occurs that kicks him in the rear that gets things going. So. So using the Shrek analogy, um, Shrek lives in the swamp. 
he perceives himself as the monster. He doesn't see himself as a hero. Um, he wants to be left alone. And he doesn't want to deal with everyone else because no one wants to deal with him. He's an ogre, a monster. And he wants to be left alone because he accepted that that's what his place is, to be alone forever. Until something happens that is not of his own doing. For Quad took the fairy creatures and dumped it on his property because he just hate fairy tale creatures. This is not of Shrek's doing, this is from the antagonistic forces that are encroaching into his life, his way of doing things. You don't have to have it where it is the villain, but it's someone that is, or something, that occurs that is not part of the character or the hero's plan. It just popped into the life, now they had to deal with it. And how they deal with it is their old ways. Uh, their familiar tactics of doing things. So, using the Shrek analogy, he went on to go to Farquaad's castle and tell him, get rid of these fair creatures out of my swamp. I don't want them, you are going to do it, or else I'll be the monster. So. This is the whole thing here. Um, they are going to react their old normal ways. In the Joseph Campbell, this is where they refuse the call. They don't always have to. Um, as you are writing this, you're going to get a glimpse of who they are. Um, well, not a glimpse. You're going to be showcasing how they normally react to things, how they see the world, and it's not going to be pretty sometimes. Um, like Bilbo Baggins, um, he just wants to stay in Hobbiton, and he doesn't care for the dwarves being in his house and partying. Um, same thing with Shrek, he doesn't like these creatures, and he's going to go to Falquad and tell them get out. Now here, just like a story is a circle, it also can be a mirror of what had previously occurred. So here is a mirror to the earlier part of the story. Just kind of like a book, how um, you have uh, one side of the um, cover and the other side of the cover and how you can split the book open right in the middle and the very beginning and the very end are completely in contrast. This is no different. One of the techniques that we storytellers do is that we showcase a glimpse of the other side. So here we see a glimpse. Of what it could be. The hero or the destiny that they should be. Um, for Shrek, when he destroyed all those knights, um, he became the hero um, that will come up in the third act. Um, and But they're still in their old habits and their old ways and their own philosophy, but we get to do mirrors and glimpses of the future what we want them to be as storytellers. Now, if you have been writing so far and you don't see this, this is okay. This is something you can put in when you're editing um, or in your feature edits that you could like put in some of those little glimpses. So, on the story of Shrek, the only way he could get rid of the swamp people is if Lord Farquaad um, has a princess. They make a deal. I, you scratch my back and I scratch yours. So he goes off away from the kingdom, which is something he never has done before. He never had left the kingdom far beyond his swamp. 
this is all foreign territory. And he also have an unfamiliar situation. He has a friend named Donkey. Um, this little lovable uh, donkey decides to follow him on his quest um, to find the princess. Um, with Bilbo Baggins, he finally decided that, well, I guess I do want to venture after all, and decides to go along with the dwarves outside of Hobbiton. Um, going beyond Bree is an unfamiliar territory for Bilbo Baggins. Uh, this is not something he's familiar with at all. Um, he never had delved outside of Bree, um, out, out of the borders of the Shire, and um, he's not used to the customs of um, the big folk. So because they are dealing with this unfamiliar situation, an unfamiliar territory, they still are attacking these obstacles in their old familiar habits and ways. So here, if you're using the Dramatica way, um, I will use the Dramatica points. But if you are not, that's still okay. Um, these are minor points. You can move them around roughly. It's not really going to matter to the audience. Um, they're going to recognize these major points. You don't have to have these minor points. Um, but as you're writing, keep in mind that they're still going to try to do things in their own way. And sometimes it works and sometimes it just doesn't cut it. It's like going to a foreign country, not knowing the language, not knowing the culture, um, not knowing all the habits that the people do. You're completely a stranger in strange lands. And you're going to be doing things that you're familiar with from what you are born with, uh, what you have been raised on, uh, and what values have been indoctrinated inside of you. And eventually it's just not going to cut it. And that's where this point comes in. Uh, eventually things come to a head where the exterior forces or the antagonistic forces force their hand um, the bluff that they make that, oh, I could still do this with my old ways, and showcase their bluff. Showcase that it's just not good enough um, to keep going at it the uh, way they had been. Um, and that is roughly here. It's roughly at the third, um, third way into your story. Um, or 32 percent, uh, depending on uh, your structure, but roughly a third in um, things just fall apart, it's just not working out. They have to start doing something new, but they don't know what is the new way yet. So. They are going to try something new, and try is the main word. And usually, they can't try something new without a guide. Just like Frodo and Sam and Mary and Pippin are in a um, are entering Bree and they have to deal with um, the outside world, outside of the Shire, they need a guide. And that guide is Aragon. They have been doing things their old ways, going beyond the Hobbiton into that forest, if you're going by the books. And things uh, um, more or less have been working up for them, but they have to try something new 
something a little bit different than what they have been doing. And in order for that to work for them, they had to have someone who is familiar in this unfamiliar land or situation. So they're going to try something new with someone who is teaching them the new ways. Eventually, things start to click. Um, your character is going to start taking action, um, kicking butts, taking names, eventually. Um, things are starting to come into place. Um, they start to understand and things are starting to work out for them. And they obtain something that um, was their whole goal, in a sense. Um, for Shrek, he obtained um, the princess, Princess Fiona. Um, for, for Luke Skywalker, he found Princess Leia, um, etc. So they attained what made them go out in the foreign territory in the first place. Um, and that's because it finally starting to work out for them. This point is called the moment of truth point. Um, this came from the blog um, Helping Writers Become Authors. Um, she said this is the moment of truth where they obtain some new information that makes sense for them and um, that's able to lead them out of the cave, um, so to speak, and help change the world. This is the Joseph Campbell finding the goddess. This is the torch that's given to them to help light the way and they're able to light the fire in the world and bring enlightenment. So, here, when you reach this point, they obtain information that goes counter to what their previous old viewpoint is. It is something completely new. Um, this new philosophy, this new viewpoint, this new information is going to bring out a new identity, um, a new way of life that they have never considered before. And they decide, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. Um, I'm going to use this information and we'll see how this goes. So they're going to try it. They're going to try using this truth and realize, oh hey, it's working. You know, this is helping me fight the villains. This is helping me overcome um, some issues that I have. This is helping me um, become who I need to be in the end. Um, for Shrek, um, he realized that he really does not need to be alone forever. He could have someone in his life that gets him and understands him, which is Princess Fiona. Um, so they're taking baby steps as they go. Because um, they're very hesitant that this could be too good to be true. And it sounds like too good to be true. Um, they're afraid that, you know, maybe it's just not going to work out in the end and um, everything will just fall apart. And it does, but it's not from what is working out for them, it's not from themselves, it's from the exterior forces. This comes through the second pinch point, if you wish to use this point where the exterior forces or the antagonistic forces starting to encroach what has been working out for them. They start to push back. And this scares the character. You know, this thing has been working so well and now it's finally going to be put up to the test. 
and um, I really don't know if it's going to work. And because they're so afraid and they're so scared that it's not going to work, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It doesn't work because the character lets it not work. Um, so for Shrek, he likes Princess Fiona, he's starting to fall for Princess Fiona, but when they finally come to Lord Farquaad and he hands over the princess, um, he did it because he's afraid um, of being with her. He's afraid that this is not going to work out in the end. I'm just an ogre, she's a princess, she needs her prince, I'm just not worthy of, you know, someone this gorgeous and wonderful that she is. So he lets her go. In your normal hero adventure, um, the hero tends to do something that works for them, but someone gets hurt. Um, usually it's the mentor that usually dies. This is a very old <laughs> structure. Um, this has been used in George Lucas's uh, film uh, where Obi-Wan Kenobi passes away, and Luke blames himself that it's his fault. So, because of their fear that, uh, oh, it may not work out in the end, you have this moment here where it's just dark. Um, they fall back into their old way. Um, all this time, ever since they attained the truth um, or their new philosophy, they have the old philosophy there as a safety net. In case, yeah, in case things don't work out, they could fall back onto that old way of doing things just to make sure they don't fall completely. Um, it's a backup plan just in case it's too good to be true. And they don't stay here forever. Uh, this doesn't work out for them entirely because they realize in the end this sucks. So as you are writing your story and they have obtained this new philosophy, they're going to have this um, on the second burner as a safety net and as they're taking baby steps and you're holding the carrot in front of them, take the carrot away. Um, but it's not through the character's fault, it's through the exterior force's fault. Um, and they're going to think that it is theirs. Um, it's their fault. Um, this is how it should be. Um, it's too good to be true. I'm not worthy of it. What will help you get into here is that they realize that this sucks. I can't go back to the old way of doing things. Um, it doesn't work for me anymore. Um, when Shrek went back to his swamp, he realized that he doesn't like being alone anymore. Um, it had worked. Uh, for him, long before uh, the fairy tale creatures went onto his swamp, and now that he went back and all the creatures are gone, he realized that I can't be alone forever because I want Fiona there with me. So, with an encouragement of a friend giving them the pep talk that they so need, um, they decide, okay, you know what? I'm not going to be alone forever. I am not going to be a farm boy forever. Um, I'm not a simple hobbit and hobbiton forever. I'm going to be a hero. Um, in the case of a fallen hero like Anakin, um, they're not going to be a Jedi anymore. Um, they're going to completely own the whole Sith image. Um, if you're dealing with the flat character arc, 
um, they have to abandon their old viewpoint that they have been working on and decide to go something big and completely commit to the new way. And they use the new way to overcome all these obstacles that is thrown against them. Um, for instance, um, English Skywalker, he has to deal with um, the Death Star cannons, the individual fighters, and eventually dealing with Darth Vader himself um, going after him. It all narrows down to just mano to mano, so to speak. And um, because of they're not afraid anymore because they are completely committed to this new way of doing things. It works. It works for them. And the moment that um, it really showcases how it really works for them usually comes around here. Uh, where they are attacking their nemesis, so to speak. Uh, this is kind of the moment where Luke Skywalker uh, puts that um, tracking machine back um, and says, No, 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 I'm fine. I'm cool. I can use the Force and blow the Death Star up. Um, I don't need technology. I have something greater inside. And um, just like having a mirror of the other side, we get to see a bit of a reframe of their old way of doing things. He has gone to Lord Farquaad's castle before. He has um, dealt with um, his soldiers before. He has um, dealt with Lord Farquaad himself before. So this is nothing new. Uh, this is something he has done back then. Um, with Bilbo Baggins and Luke Skywalker, this is new for them. It is a home base for other characters around them. For Princess Leia, this is the rebel base. This is a familiar territory, a familiar situation for Leia. Um, this is the home team, um, so to speak, if you're used to sports. Um, for Bilbo Baggins, um, he went to the dwarves old home. They finally made it to the Lonely Mountain. And they have to conquer the dragon and deal with the politics that came after conquering the dragon. And by the time you hit the resolution, which you can have it in the fourth or you can have it halfway however you wish to have it. Uh, it's better to have it, um, if you're writing, your last couple of chapters. Um, you don't have to have it like five chapters or so. Um, once they blow up the Death Star, or they kiss the princess, or they defeated the bad guy, or they defeated their old selves, or they finally found their true love, they live the new way of life. Um, for Luke Skywalker, he continues to live the rebel way, joining the rebel resistance, fighting against the Empire, while straddling the whole, I'm a Jedi, I use the Force, along with Leia, Han, um, Chewbacca, and the rest of the crew. That's his new way of life, that's his new identity and purpose. So, this will help you propel into your other series in your books. This new way of life eventually becomes old. It becomes the old way of doing things. Eventually, they're going to have a set routine. They're going to get comfortable in doing things. Uh, when we go into the Empire Strikes Back, they're on Hoth. They always have been running away from the Empire 
always one step ahead and they always had been doing their rebel operations um, trying to take down the Empire and they're struggling so that's the old way um, Luke is completely involved in the rebel alliance he is using some of his force capabilities um, to help them but he's not really a Jedi so to speak he has to abandon this old philosophy of him being a Jedi I mean him being a rebel and obtain this new philosophy of I am a Jedi and I have to own up to that identity, that image, that training, that tradition. And when we go into the last movie, um, he becomes that Jedi um, in the very beginning. He becomes this idealistic um, Jedi that is going to save people and take names. Um, we always wonder if he's going to turn to the dark side. Um, is he going to resist the temptations that have befell his father? So, you can see how you could propel and use this as you continue on in your series, where the new way becomes the old way, and they have to grow, they have to change, because life is making them transform and change. And if it's not themselves that needs to transform and change, the world needs to change because something has to give. Um, for instance, in the Mockingjay, even though she hardly changed as a character, the world keeps changing around her. And it keeps changing around her because she is discovering something new, a new piece of information she can utilize to force that change. So, there you have it. That's the character arc. Um, I hope this is helpful and informative. Um, you can use these points, like the 25, 30%, 50%, 60%, 75%, whatever, to kind of see where you are in your story. But ultimately, you won't know until you actually finish your story and uh, when you do go back and edit you can use the plot arc and the character arc to enhance your story because the first draft is just getting it down on paper the editing part is just to help make it more dramatic and translate it to the audience um, the audience is familiar with this arc they're familiar with the plot arc and the character arcs. Um, it's just a matter of how you interpret it, um, how you decide how the character is going to transform into this new way, how they are going to react and act on things that is different than before. Um, or showcase something that we never seen before, like in Atlanta with um, Donald Glover, we never seen that type of society, um, that type of way of life on TV. And um, it's still using the same structure that is here um, in the character arc, in the plot arc. So if you have any questions, leave it down below. Um, I'll answer them as soon as I can. And um, I thank you for your patience um, for this late video. Um, and if you like this video, go ahead and give it a like. Um, go ahead and click on that bell. Um, I tried to pin these things on Thursday, but just like this video, sometimes these things come out later. And the one way you know for sure you'll be notified with a new video that is out of the usual is to hit that bell. Um, I have other videos uh, that you can explore on my channel. Uh, go ahead and click subscribe so you can look at those videos at your convenience. And I'll talk to you later. Bye!